So when we are in a relationship, looking for a relationship, we have to be aware of what we're looking for. But I can promise you this. You're looking for very, something very different in them than they're looking for in you. Your narcissistic relationship is or was imbalanced for lots of reasons. You have different motivations, different definitions of love, of closeness, of connection. They use the relationship for supply. You were looking for connection. As a result, people in these relationships feel chronically confused, a sense of seeking, right? And over time, blame themselves more and more for not being able to make it work. Obviously, this varies depending on whether this is a parent or a partner or a friend or a colleague, but especially when the relationship involves dynamics like love or attachment. This imbalance is a heartfelt issue and one that you may not even be able to put your finger on. Narcissistic relationships, especially in the beginning in adulthood, can burn bright, excite us, feel like a really good fit, the love bombing and the charm and the charisma and the bells and the whistles. That period doesn't last and you know the rest of that story. The trauma bond is created out of that alternation, right? The making sense of the good and bad, the going back, back and forth between the praise and the criticism and the quest to maintain that connection and closeness that you believe are there. It slips away slowly and then it slips away more quickly and we try to hold on. And as part of that, and in a, and a way to sort of feel in control in these relationships, we became very skilled at staring at the relationship and trying to find the good stuff. This is a given that children will do this, who will try to find the tiniest thread to hold on to. Oh, they brought me, my mom brought me tea that one time I was sick. And that one action can somehow cordon off all of the bad stuff that accumulates. For a child to do this, it's survival. They need the parent, they need the attachment. But that also trails into adulthood. And even when it is not our parent, we are like people sifting through the wreckage of a burned down building. We can find the tiny lost diamond in the midst of the devastation. We stare at the relationship and we will notice anything, anything. You'll notice that no matter how badly things are going, you'll say, oh, they're so huggy and sweet with the dog, or they cried at that movie, or she donated to the food drive, or, oh my gosh, he got me that necklace that I had been coveting, or he did smile at me during the wedding, or, well, this year she got up on Christmas morning and didn't get drunk and gave us presents that she wrapped. I mean, the bar is pretty low. It's, I sneezed and they said, bless you. But sometimes these signs can be confusing. What can feel like them showing emotion, crying during a sad movie, but as we stare at their tears, we sort of forget that when we were struggling or crying, they typically looked at us somewhat indifferently or called us sensitive or laughed at us or said, what the hell are you crying about? They may do what seem like generous things for other people, but not for you. And so you are confused, wondering if maybe you're asking too much. But simply put, when we are in a narcissistic relationship that we are having difficulty getting out of, we can get lost and looking for the little so-called good things that they do and holding on to them as proof of the narcissistic person's goodness. And then it really gets complicated because instead of having a balanced view of the relationship, they do some things that are nice for other people, but in the, this relationship with you, they're consistently selfish and lack empathy. And we strive to make them really good in our heads, I guess, maybe because that's because that white noise cancels the stuff that is uncomfortable. And more importantly, that so-called good stuff they do allows us to maintain that routine, that homeostasis. We don't have to make painful decisions about things like 
getting out or heaven forbid, having to face the world alone. Again, sometimes the devil we know and all of that. But here's where it gets challenging. As you sit there and stare into this narcissistic relationship and attempt to find all the good stuff, they aren't doing that about you. Instead, they're looking for your not so good stuff. You do a hundred good things, they manage to find the one bad one. Maybe you were late or didn't fully listen to them when they said something, or maybe gave them a small bit of feedback about something, or forgot to run an errand you were supposed to run, or didn't read their mind. And that is what gets harped on and that they will focus on over and over. You may get it right everywhere in this relationship. Do 50 things right, but that one thing that you don't get just right basically gets a spotlight and a neon sign and reinforces that perpetual sense that everyone who is in one of these relationships has that you are not enough and you can't get it right. It sets that impossible standard of perfection. If only I got it just right, then I wouldn't be in this mess with them. The narcissistic person will preferentially pull out and focus on your mistakes just as you are focusing on and trying to find their temporary and fleeting virtues. And all of this makes for a real mess for anyone in these relationships. Because not only are you always trying to find their good stuff, you are trying to ignore the lots of bad stuff and then feel bad when you can't find more good stuff. Perhaps you even call yourself a downer or believe that you have too high a standard. And then your so-called mistakes or missteps or not getting it just right is being focused on by the narcissistic person, which means that you're being told that you aren't good, whatever that means. And the combination of the two not only means that you constantly self-blame, but also that you keep trying harder and harder to find the good in them, just as they are finding the not good in you. Narcissistic people are often searching for threat. It's the nature of the personality, and it's related to something that we call persecutory ideation. Basically, they feel that people are always out to get them. They often feel that they aren't getting what they deserve. They feel entitled to something, and when it doesn't happen, no matter how unrealistic it is, they always feel let down, right? And they almost like people are out to get them, seriously. And they live in a chronic sense of shame. So even a small, small thing is experiences like this big psychological earthquake and they lash out. There's that shame and rage spiral. In the case of more severe personalities like sociopathy or psychopathy, there's this sort of constant thin-skinned edginess. They're always looking for the problems. I mean, I guess in a way, only one thief could smell out another, right? And so they often view the motives of other people through a very distorted lens. They always think someone's working an angle. And they're quite capable of either manufacturing emotion like their crocodile tears, or you may perceive their emotions as empathy when in fact, it's really just a selfish show of feeling. For example, they watch that movie they're, they're crying at, and they're crying because they wonder what it would feel like if that terrible thing happened to them, rather than identifying with the sadness of the character. So you, like everything else in their life and everyone, is a sort of potential threat, a potential disappointment, something for them to defend against. While you are looking for a tiny sliver of light in this relationship, anything to foster connection with them, they're looking for threat, it doesn't work. Where you are looking for their goodness, they are looking for your mistakes, for you not delivering on what they feel entitled to, for you pinging their shame, for you as a potential threat. Sometimes understanding that can help you recognize that it's not you and that short of you reading their mind, and always ensuring that you don't do anything to set them off, that constant hypervigilance we feel in these relationships, they will keep finding the problems in you while you hold on to less and less 
frequent examples of their goodness. But whatever little breadcrumbs there are, you might build wonderful narratives, loving narratives around those brief but cherished good moments they give you, but that are interspersed with lots of moments that confuse you, hurt you, and break your heart. How does that old lyric go, right? You keep looking for a coupe de ville in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box, but in reality, you end up having to craft a big story around the crappy little prize you do get at the bottom of those Cracker Jacks. More difficult is at the same time, they are looking for that cloud on a perfect and beautiful sunny day at the beach, or they're looking for the flaw in the diamond. In these relationships, you're both looking for different things. Remember that, and it can help give you some insight as to the constant asymmetry of these relationships. Thanks again.